Thank you. Great. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm uh, Henry Weber, and um, I'm currently trying to finish my PhD um, in archaeology and precision agriculture, or agri-tech, and I'll go into a bit more about what that means um, in, in the talk. Um, but yeah, I'm based down in Bristol in the UK, and um, I've sort of, I'm a weird hybrid of half farmer, half archaeologist, and do a little bit of policy work on the side. Um, and so this is sort of something that I've just been interested in for quite a long time, really, in terms of the use of technology within farming, and the use of that sim similar technologies within agriculture, um, specifically around sort of soil mapping and geophysics and those sorts of things. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of little um, sort of snippets of some of my case studies that are coming out of my PhD um, and hopefully talk a little bit about the sort of policy side of things and, and, and making the case um, to relate to the talk. So first of all, probably not that many of you are that familiar with the sort of agri-tech um, sort of phrase um, and there's sort of there's precision agriculture, precision farming, agri-tech, they're all really the same sort of thing. It's the use of technology um, to enable, um, well, to collect evidence on one side of things, I guess, to collect data, and to then try and turn all of that evidence and data into some decisions that help farmers to either improve their yields on certain fields in certain areas of crop, um, or sometimes it's even for sort of better environmental um, sort of sustainability. So maybe it'll be used to use less fertilizers um, and um, less sort of seed or whatever that, that could obviously, you know, if you've got too much fertilizer, then you can have more runoff. Um, so it's a collection of technologies, and that sort of photo there just shows you how much there is um, that farms are using. And essentially, it concentrates the level of scale of management down. So instead of farms looking at a whole field, they're trying to break that down into zones within the field because it makes sense that soils differ because of many factors. Um, and actually, therefore, when farmers are looking at their crops and trying to keep their crops growing healthy, um, they need to do it on the zone-based sort of uh, level of, um, of, of uh, resolution. So often you'll see... Um, the main sort of technologies used are things like satellite imagery has been used for quite a while. I mean, the history of precision farming and agri-tech goes back to about the 1990s. Um, mainly developed in sort of the US and uh, Australia on bigger farms. But now it's becoming the norm, really, um, and, and especially in the EU as well. Um, about 70% of land in the UK has probably had some sort of technology um, aspect to the farming um, arrangement, whether that's the GPS systems that keep farmers use of driving very straight lines um, and making sure they don't get overlap, so again they're sort of reducing down their losses, or satellite imagery, drones, uh, and also the software side of it. So there's, there's the sort of hardware in terms of collecting the data, but actually then there's a lot of software now and there's a big, it's a quite a big industry. Um, and it's, it's very sort of favoured by uh, government because it's just sort of getting farmers to use technology, it sort of saves them costs, um, but also you know, businesses aren't earning a lot of money out of providing this sort of data as well. Um, and so now there are sort of software platforms um, that obviously are GIS based, they're allowing farmers to look at all of their satellite imagery, they're looking at multiple images throughout the year across different crop types, um, they've got all their soil maps there, they've got even aspects of, um, sort of um, soil erosion as Carl was talking about in terms of so the farmers can see where there are areas of, sort of high soil erosion risk. Um, and so it's starting to provide actually a little bit more of a, almost a reporting mechanism for farmers as well, where it makes it very easy to comply with any sort of regulations surrounding maybe application of fertilisers or something like that. Uh, and that's something that I think is quite interesting and, and it would be useful to sort of think about that from the heritage perspective and, and maybe how archaeology could be integrated within that. And at the moment, archaeology is not really considered at all um, in this zone, um, even though they're looking at sort of the base of the idea is to just look at soil uh, variability and crop variability. No one really has answered, you know, the impact of archaeology within that area. And that's something that I try to do um, in my project. So, again, sort of, there's, there's a, now a, on every farm that is 
I mean, very obviously farms differ a lot, farmers differ a lot, um, and some of them will like to use technology, some of them will not like to use technology, so it does depend a little bit. But look, on most farms, um, if they're using sort of precision farming agri-tech um, systems, you get this cycle of data collection throughout the year. Um, you've got all the sort of standard, you know, Google Earth type imagery that will be collected. Um, but there's also soil imagery, there's a zoning process, so around on the, the sort of one or two o'clock stage end circle, you've got the process where the company and the farmer tries to break down that field into a number of different zones, and then those zones can be sampled differently for sort of different soil nutrients. Uh, and then that tends to that sort of is how it gets put back round into the process of you see where different zones are performing differently. So that's, for example, a yield map um, of a certain crop of certain year, and you'll get sample imagery uh, throughout the whole year. Um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, you can, again, the, the level of data that each farm will have will be very different. So some people will like to use sample imagery, some people would rather use drones, and actually there's a, there's a huge boom in using drones. Um, obviously across all areas, but um, again, in agriculture, there's a lot of companies now set up to do very high resolution imagery. So although some of the satellite imagery will be 5, 10 meter resolution, um, we're, we're sort of starting to see a lot, um, a lot higher resolution, which is more beneficial when you think about, again, the links with uh, sort of archaeological prospection and evaluations. So here's um, an example of a case study site in um, Dorset um, in, in the UK. Essentially, we've got um, a field with um, part of a geophysical survey that was done um, by a university, um, just sort of on a research project. But there's a, um, an Iron Age banjo enclosure, which is there in the magnetometry with a series of pits um, around it. Um, now, when I talked to the farmer and said, well, look, do you use any precision farming sort of data? Um, he then sort of opened up his toolbox, which is a bit of software, and there's loads of satellite imagery and everything to sort of look through. Um, and there's some clear correlations there between the crop growth, which is shown in that NDVI satellite image, which is looking at how green and how healthy the crop is. Um, now, from a precision farming perspective, if you just looked at the satellite imagery, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, have, you know, wouldn't necessarily say, oh, that's definitely archaeology that's causing that. It could be weeds, it could be various other things. But by trying to combine the two, um, and the precision farming company, again, didn't have any idea that there was any archaeological data that was collected on the site, so I was trying to sort of just merge the two together. Um, you have a better understanding of what's causing that variability, and then you can look at that through multiple years and go back through other sort of satellite imagery um, to see whether that gives you anything. Now, in this case, it's really a benefit um, to the agricultural process, the, the agri-tech process, because actually that doesn't that satellite which doesn't really tell you anything more about the archaeology. Um, but then I'm going to go move on to an example the other way around, which is part of where there's value for the archaeologist rather than from or from the farming data. You see what I mean? So again, we've got an NDVI image on the left-hand side, um, which is a high resolution, that's a drone-based one. Um, this field is actually in Wiltshire, there's a, there's a henge monument just here, that's just there for the terminus of the henge. Um, and there's a magnetic survey that's already been done, um, which is very high resolution with a cesium magnetometer. And there's this obviously nice L-shaped feature that you've got um, just above, just north of the henge. And actually the, by the drone image, you can start to see that that forms more of a square rather than just an angle. You can actually see there's an edge there and then there's an edge there. Um, so that's the example where there is use for some certain bits of data that are coming from the agri-tech side um, to then actually help interpret the archaeology um, slightly more. Um, so that's sort of on the flip side. This is another um, case study site in Oxford, uh, near Oxford. There's um, so again, it's a quite a big field um, with a geophysical survey on it, and the little white box there is a scheduled area because of the, the Roman villa there. Um, and again, what I was sort of thinking about doing is how 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 is that useful for the farmer? Could it be useful for the farmer? And I did a, a round of soil sampling um, that produced um, just a topsoil map of the sort of elements um, in the topsoil, and especially ones that are probably more relevant to the farmer. 
And there's a map of the phosphorus variation in the field, which actually really nicely matches all of the archaeological features that are interpreted from the geophysical survey. Um, and also, I've got a map of the lead content in the topsoil, and you see there's really quite high lead content up in that top corner, which is all relates to previous field boundaries and previous land use. So I think that's it's, it's nice and as a case study because it shows you that obviously you've got different archaeological features and different sort of land uses in different areas, but they can have different impacts on the soil depending on what they are, and therefore have different impacts on the farmer. So phosphorus, the phosphorus variation, let's go back, is basically double amount of the amount of phosphorus in the soil um, around the villa and around some of the areas at the top um, in comparison to the rest of the field. And phosphorus is a major element that farmers need to apply pretty much every year to keep their soil levels at the right, right level because they're obviously off-taking phosphorus in the crop that they're harvesting. So that's where you can actually um, help the farmer and that's exactly what the precision farming process is trying to do, is just to delineate zones where you could sort of start applying less or more fertilizer as, as is sort of required depending on the soil. And this is on the same field. Um, this is actually a, a drone image but um, of a trial site. So a lot of farmers will be basing their decisions off of trial sites that will be looking at variation of fertilizer or plants or various things. Now, they usually try and put these sites on areas where the soil is like nice and conform um, and um, where there isn't much variability in the soil. Again, do they think about the archaeology that could be underneath the trial site? Because that's the geophysics showing you there, the old, again, there's those sort of field boundaries where the lead content are very high in the soil above it. Just, um, just over there where that sort of large magnetic there, there's a, there was a World War One isolation hospital there. Uh, and there's a few other buildings in, in obviously that other um, the sort of top left enclosure as well. So again, actually, uh, probably not the most, uh, you know, Sort of um, stable soil to then be putting your, your trials and basing all of your data off of those sort of trial areas. So that's, that's something that's quite interesting. Um, another aspect where, again, inputting archaeology and sort of the archaeological record and what we know of, of, of the sort of spatial distribution of archaeology uh, into the farming system can help with soil sampling. So again, farmers will be soil sampling every three to four years, especially in the UK, I mean, that's the sort of recommended rate. Now there's three main routes of how you would sample, so to get like a representative sample. There's a W shape, you might just walk across the field, um, or there's a, a sort of hectare grid, and you could take a point um, and take a sample in each hectare. Or there's a zone-based approach, which uh, if you look at the red lines, there's basically two zones in this field, there's a lower zone and an upper zone, and they, that might have been determined via just looking at Google Earth or, or, or just the farmer saying this bit of the soil is different to this bit. Um, but the archaeology that in this field, um, which is shown in the sort of little polygons there, that's actually taken from the historic environment record, so that was already known, it didn't have to have more work done to it. Actually, there's a nearly hinge right in the middle of the actual colour variation there, phosphorus variation over the field. Um, and so, again, soil sampling is not that representative if you're not taking into account the small-scale variations that archaeology and archaeological sites um, can have. So, there are sort of some snapshots, really, of, of, of what, um, sort of where there's value, I guess, in understanding the archaeological record and also trying to think of how it can be used um, within um, agri-tech systems. And so on a practical level, there are, there's, there's some value there, I think, um, in being able to share data, perhaps. That's the very, that very, very key aspect, is the sharing of data between very different communities, I guess, um, and what level that can be done. Obviously, I've been sharing data just between a farmer and, and the archaeologist on a very specific scale, and whether that could be uh, sort of put up into a, a sort of more regional or even a farm level scale is, is quite an interesting thought that you know probably needs more 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 work on. Um, but I mean it, it helps in terms of discovery and delineation of archaeological sites. If there's so much more data, satellite imagery, drone imagery being collected, then you know there's potential for a lot more discovery of new sites and for understanding how the sort of character of, of existing sites works. It's sort of similar to the drought conditions that we had um, this year uh, and how much new Sort of information that brings. Um, 
But then equally, from the other side about it, actually there is a real need for farmers and the sort of companies selling this data to actually understand what that is, is set, telling them about the soil variation. And I think from my, my sort of feedback from working with some of these companies is that it is pretty useful having the archaeology as a layer that they can input to help them interpret why they've got funny patches in their field, which is, you know, not, not you know, they, they didn't know why this causing that. Because um, that means that whether they can do anything about it, and sort of have that decision based. Um, um, and there's been some work done on how we could integrate a bit more the um, the archaeological aspect in terms of conserving archaeology and protecting archaeology um, within these systems. So in Germany and Saxony, there's um, been done some work on variable rate cultivation, where the tractor, as it goes over the field, different zones and different soil types, will lift the cultivator up and down automatically. Um, based on whatever data you put into it. So could that be used as a way for gathering archaeology into these, into these zones um, and potentially managing it through that um, is, is something that, again, in the next five years, maybe maybe will become a lot more um, sort of relevant. One minute, Henry. One minute. Oh, right. oh sorry, this is the last slide. So, <laughs> so in terms of the, the policy level, um, one thing that... I've sort of been thinking is that this the agritech sort of zone is an innovation zone and actually policy makers are not they're they're, they're very much behind the developments in the agritech zone so it's actually now I think I mean there was a paper published by the Commission I think on the potential of precision farming within the cap um, and that was published last year um, and so people are starting to think about how we can integrate this and how the policy fits with this new level of technology um, and, and that's something that really, I think, if we can maybe perhaps position archaeology in the frame of the use of technology and all the new data that's coming on board, it might be really useful for, um, yeah, for, for archaeology as a whole in terms of future uh, heritage management. Um, but it would be, yeah, be interesting to hear people's thoughts on that as well from more of a practical point of view, because um, I'm looking at it from more of a, you know, just the sort of data point of view, I guess, and the sort of study of the archaeology and agriculture. Um, so, yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you.